there wasn't anyone in the nation where they were. So they were eight months ahead of the national conversation. And they were creating that because they understood their guiding principles for decision-making, that deep level of communication. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Accelerate Your Performance podcast. I'm your host, Janet Pilcher. Thanks for having a desire to be your best at work and help your organization achieve success. This podcast is all about actions we can take to improve workplace culture and achieve results, and they're all aligned to our nine principles for organizational excellence. Today, my colleague, Dr. Pat Greco, Senior Director of Thought Leadership, will join me again on the show to discuss her article in the April edition of the American Association of School Administrators magazine. Over the next several weeks, I will be joined by authors of several articles featured in this issue. So, so glad to have Pat with us today to kick it off. As the former superintendent at the School District of Menominee Falls, Pat has continued to work closely with their leadership team as they continue to sustain and accelerate the improvement work to increase student engagement, improve parent confidence, keep people safe, and sustain learning outcome through cycles of improvement. So today, Pat and I will discuss how the the superintendent in Menominee Falls and the leadership team continue to remove barriers and resolve problems to improve outcomes for those they serve. And I've had the great privilege of closely working with the school district of Menominee Falls team and am excited, as always, about telling their story. Also, Corey Gala, superintendent of Menominee Falls, has been on our show several times. So connect back to those episodes to hear from Corey. So Pat, welcome today. It's great to have you back on the show and look forward to this conversation. Thanks, Janet. And it's always a pleasure. And it's it's always an honor to represent the work of the team, the community, the best thinking, and the journey that we've been on together. Because Janet, you were there from the beginning and, and it continues a decade later. So it's really an honor to join this morning. It is. Pat, always like to talk about the work that's been done, you know, that you started that Corey and team are continuing to move forward because it's a model and presents so many best practices that we can all learn from and continue to grow from. So let's start with, you know, gosh, for the past 15 months, it's hard to believe that we're saying 15 months, but for the past 15 months, leaders have experienced the pressure to make decisions quickly. And, you know, I know Menominee Falls did a great job with that. So how did the district leaders navigate their own stress levels as they tried to stay centered on what they do best is the needs of students and staff? It was really a pleasure to listen to Corey and the team make that reflection. You know, so when schools closed on that Friday, the very next Saturday morning, that next day, Corey had a set of core guiding principles for the board and the leadership team to lean into and reflect on. One of the things that all of them indicated is as their own pressure built, the routines that worked for them under normal circumstances became the lifeline they became more important in a crisis because it created that cadence for that decision-making, created that sense of calm for the people that they worked with. When everything else was in chaos, people actually could lean into the routines that mattered most. So what what they were reflecting on is they were having weekly huddles that moved to daily huddles. They had guiding principles for decision-making that they kept out in front of the team on a regular basis. They centered on what they knew. You know, So when you think about using that plus delta all the time, what's known, what's a challenge, what's next? Who needed to be included around the table? You know, so as you think about the, you know, the decision-making rules, how do you make the decision of who has the information, who do we need to communicate to? And then really why, what, and how? Because every team member, you have a thousand people plus a community, plus every parent and all of the children. Why are we doing this? What are we going to be doing? What's next? And when are you going to hear more next? And then who do they submit questions to? So when I say those elegantly simple routines were their lifeline, that's what every member of the team when we were talking about the article kept on coming back. The routines mattered, keeping people well-informed, accelerate the amount of time together 
so that they could make those decisions well. But that acceleration of the amount of time together wasn't a five-hour meeting. It was a 40-minute meeting, checking data every morning, and then doing that wrap-up at the end of the week so that people could consistently get that structure in place. Every staff member was coming together for the Wednesday huddles virtually, and then the community updates would go out every Friday. And then Tina Posnanski, the building principals, would send out the next week's preview to parents on Sunday. So rather than waiting to a Friday end of the week, they were previewing what's coming up. So everything they learned about the process were tools they had used in the typical, but now they were hardwiring in a way that really mattered makes me think about a couple of things. One, I've done a, a couple of podcasts where I've talked about moving routines to habits. And I think what you're explaining now is that's exactly what happened. You know, that that it became, they became habits of practice. They did routines and just habits of practice. It's very natural in terms of just what we do when we connect and work together. And then 15 months ago, when we were thinking about how we can provide support and writing the first toolkit, that's a piece that's in there. Anticipating that that would need to be there you know, but not seeing it in action. But, you know, what, what we see in Menominee Falls is just how that plays out in action. So, you know, appreciate that focus, Pat. Let's continue to talk about the AASA article. And the title is Learning from Wicked Challenges. You explained that in, improvement is co-owned, I love this, co-owned from the classroom to the boardroom. Can you share what that looks like within a district when that's occurring? Yeah, and, and when you think about what it looks like in action is the board understands how decisions are going to be made, the decision rules, they feel informed, they feel connected. The children and the teachers are feeling informed, connected, those processes are in place. The, the main piece is, is when they have barriers, there's that sense of we can tease through anything because we know the process to solve a problem, to communicate it, and to scale what works and stop what doesn't. Yeah, so too often when we're thinking about improvement, we're thinking about the complexity of how we learn to be improvers. When it's in work, it's kids talking to their teachers and debriefing, here's my goal, here's what's working for me, here's where I'm getting stuck, here's how I know I'm making progress. You know, so all of the elements are at work, and then the teachers are talking together, we, here's our goal. Here are the students that are that are progressing. The other piece that was profound was rather than getting stuck in the emotion across the system, no one was blaming. And I can say this with confidence. Every person I interviewed said their teams leaned in. Everyone was willing to do what it took to tease through that next step. Communication flowed seamlessly. Well, that doesn't just happen. All right. Right. I mean, these right. mean that means the processes are in place to have communication flowing, understanding how students are making progress, understanding what they're looking for as far as those measures that matter most. And when they have barriers, who is going to be around that table to have that conversation at the grade level, at the building level, at that team level. And when we think about that improvers, it's when everyone sees there's a challenge, not waiting for somebody to make the decision, digging in to say, what's the barrier? What might we do? And then bringing that, what might we do to the people that are affected by that? Tina told an elegantly simple story of a group of support team members at, at her building, elementary school. They had all of their protocols set up for hallway routines, playground pro protocols. Snow was projected, and these were for the little ones that were coming in, that that projection of bad weather messed up all of their processes. So rather than saying, Tina, what should we do? Those supervisors got together, called their own huddle, and said, what might we do that could solve the problem? then came back to Tina and said, we're predicting this may be a problem. And if it, if it is a problem, this is how we intend to respond. Just wanted to let you know. Yes, That's right. an army of improvers. So the process, they trust one another. They know they have permission to solve, right? Yes. And they came to the table with a solution. That's an army of improvers. 
Yeah. So let's dig a little bit deeper with that process of what they did. And then, you know, one of the things that you highlighted was that the students finished last year, they finished doing their virtual in the spring and Menominee Falls leaders realized that their youngest students in pre-K through second grade, you know, had a little learning loss that they had to address. So thinking about what you just said, what did the teachers and leaders do to solve for this? And then what was the result, Pat? You know, when we think about the measures that matter most, the classroom measures were critical and they're never perfect, but there's what we got, right? So they use the common checkpoints. They realized that the children in 4K through second grade had the greatest trouble staying on track to milestones in that time period. So as they were planning into fall, they took together all of the barriers. What would they need for social distancing? How could they keep the kids three through 12 engaged in a functioning way, right? They prioritized getting the little ones into the building with those levels of support. And then they prioritized the barriers for three through five, six through eight, nine through 12, and solved for the way that the schedule would work with the feedback from the staff members. So they were ready in fall to bring the little ones back. They had the schedule set up. They knew how that flow of the building was going to keep everybody safe. They also didn't wait for someone else to bring them the answers. They were leaning into possible scenarios. They weren't getting stuck by, we're not being told what might happen. You know, so they were leaning into those projections. They made the specific challenges clear. You know, so how do we keep the kids who are hybrid engaged when they're at home? Well, the teachers came up with, this is how we're going to build this daily schedule. This is how we're going to provide small group support. This is how we're going to dedicate our support staff members. They built full schedules for the day and had it really clear how they were going to manage the day, the week you know, the month, they knew their decision rules of when kids would have to go into quarantine. They stayed hardwired to their protocols. There wasn't a battle of wills within the system because they had one clear mission of the best possible way to keep kids on track. They made the assumption that kids were pacing typically. And when the classroom data indicated they weren't, they did that wraparound support with the extra help for the kids that were struggling from week to week. So they didn't wait six months to say, we've got kids who are, who are experiencing learning at loss. They were able to use that. So every part of the way, they were able to test their changes, get their feedback on what was working, and really lean into this is going to make the biggest difference for the kids. The other piece that really struck me was their decision-making process was trusted by the board because the board was in the loop all the way through. Their decision-making process was trusted by families because they were going back to their why. We want to keep your kids safe, learning. We know it's not ideal, but based on these conditions, these are our next actions. So that was the beauty of that, how they, how they used that data from spring and really prepared well into fall. As I listen to you, you know, sometimes when we go into organizations, there's the culture that's been set over time, you know, where I think, Pat, you know, leaders are relying on somebody to tell them what to do. And as I listen to you, as we're talking now, I mean, we know this, but in order for us to move to move an organization out of that culture, really focusing in on those measures that matter seem yeah. to be, I mean, they're key, right? Because you can't do do any of the actions that you talked about unless you're really tracking to those measures because that's the motivating factor that people are looking at, you know, that keeps their attention. You know, that just yeah. hit me. I mean, yeah. I'm kind of like, I know that, but it just really reinforced it if that makes sense to you. Yeah, and the measures that matter and the decision rules, you know, so they knew, you know, where their case counts were, right? They knew if their case counts did this, this would be their decision rule. They knew when their cases started going down, they had the ability to actually take that next phase. There wasn't anyone in the nation where they were. So they were eight months ahead of the national conversation. And they were creating that because they understood their guiding principles for decision-making, that deep level of communication. Jeff Nunnig and the team had took the summer 
to prototype a hybrid classroom and had virtual Zoom meetings coming in for feedback loops from teachers of, if we set it up this way, will this meet your needs? What barriers do you predict you're going to have so that we can solve for them? Everyone knew how those hybrid classes were going to work when they opened in fall. They knew because they were already engaged in the problem solving and yeah. the decision making. They weren't kept at arm's length. It wasn't Jeff and his tech teams in the library teasing yeah. through all of it. It was Jeff and the tech teams starting, getting feedback, improving, getting feedback, improving, and then saying, we're going to start, you're going to keep on giving us feedback every week until we get this nailed down. What resources do you need? We're going to make sure you have them. That's the process of an army of improvers. That's great. So, Pat, as we close today, you know, can, and we're talking about army of improvers, um, so significant. Can you leave us with a recommendation for other leaders who who want to turn their organizations into army of improvers? Because I think as we come out of the pandemic, it's probably going to be more important than ever that we focus our attention in this way. So, what recommendations do you have? My convictions are even stronger than they have ever been, Janet, is yeah. we have to invest in the brain power of the people around problem solving. We have to know the measures that matter most. We have to leverage time for our talent to meet together, just in time data around that and critical important information. We should be alarmed when we hear that adage of 70% of change efforts fail. We should be alarmed by that because it's just accepted as if that's fact, right? So as we're doing change efforts, we should be doing tests of change and scaling only what works. We should lean into the what doesn't work and be as happy when we know that it doesn't work as when it does, but let's not find out after we've scaled it to 500 people, right? You know, right. so... We have to understand how to reduce the isolation. We have to commit to really helping people understand the process of improvement, iterations, scaling what works, and designing time for people to work together. If we do that, we can fundamentally change our field. And if we can figure out how to get the data to the right people at the right time quickly, we are sitting on a change in our field like healthcare had. So as we think about that, what do we need? You know, we've got to engage leaders as the champions of improvement, right? We've got to stop investing in things that we hope will work without testing whether or not they work. We should be able to tell the story of effect with our investments. And there's never a more important time because we are getting this rare infusion of funds into our field. We should know that that's invested wisely in the brain power, manpower, and skill power of the people to build that army of improvers. Because once that happens, it's unstoppable. Yeah, so good. And just thinking about as we highlight Menominee Falls in the magazine, you know, highlighting some of the other partners, you just good stories to tell as we continue this journey. It's our major work. I'm excited about it as well. And you and I have had a number of conversations. It, it's our work, you know, for the next years. It's what we're committed to is to build the army of improvers and really help work with partner organizations together, you know, to change our profession in ways that will be life-changing for students and for their families. So Pat, just appreciate the conversation today. I always learn from you, always love having the conversation and in a way that builds different types of structure. And I hope everybody, as you're listening to this, regardless of the organization you're in, that's what I was just thinking, Pat, as you were giving your recommendations, regardless of your K-12 higher ed government, you know, those recommendations apply to almost any organization that's out there. Um, our commitment is to, to really work in partnership with others. So, and I know that is your commitment as well. So again, thank you for being with us today. Always an honor. Love the love the passion, love the process, and love the love the impact. So, you know, it, it it's really an honor to work with this team and with the pe people that we serve. Thank you.
So continue to join me each week as I highlight the authors of the April edition from the School Administrator Magazine. We appreciate our colleagues at the magazine who have supported this work and continue to support K-12 education. We are also featuring these authors and other leaders at our roundtables. Our roundtables are held on Tuesday at 2 o'clock Central Time. We also have a special showcase session with our authors at What's Right in Education that will be this coming October. So we're continuing to highlight the great work and continuing to learn from the people in the field. To learn more about our upcoming events and virtual events like our roundtables and What's Right in Education, just visit studereducation.com slash events. We're still virtual this year, and we feel like we've created a, a great virtual experience for our attendees. But next year, we'll see you all in person I'm looking so forward to that. So as always, thank you for tuning in to Accelerate Your Performance. Please connect with us if you're looking for more resources related to today's episode. Head over to studereducation.com slash podcast. Look forward to connecting with you next time as we continue to focus on the nine principles for organizational excellence so that we can be our best at work. Have a great week, everyone.